Welcome to episode 238 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton. I'm again joined by Frances Tomas, Barcelona columnist, featured on ESPN and Barcelona.com creator and founder. That is Frances Tomas. Frances, I know the club's finances aren't doing too well, but how are you doing? <laughs> Hola, Cules. Uh, I, I thought for a second you were going to ask me about my finances. My no, finances no. are rubbish. <laughs> I'm doing sort of okay. Um, um, it's always better when Barca win pretty much consistently. Um, results have been great lately and, you know, my life has got a lot of aspects, but mainly Barca is at the heart of it. And when Barca are winning, everything is better. Yeah, I work in podcasts and video. So I, however good you think my finances are that our listeners might assume, I, I think you're right. It's not as bad as FC Barcelona for sure because I, I manage my debt. <laughs> but we're going to talk about that at the end of the show. Barca's finances problems. It's not the most exciting topic, but something we have to hit. But before that, we are going to review the two matches since we last spoke. That is Cornea and LJ, both 2 nothing wins in entirely different fashion, if you will. And I think for this, Frances, to start the show, we're going to try to not get too get off our lawn, you know, these, these nasty kids on the internet, blah, 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 blah. But we have to start with this anyway. So for our listeners, Frances almost never, ever, ever, ever hits me up with things or topics he wants to talk about. But he left me two voice messages. So that tells you how urgent and how important it was that we started the show with this. So, Frances, I think the question to kind of lead you into what you want to discuss would be, what do you think Kool-Aids expect to see against lesser opponents, particularly this season, and how that might be different than previous seasons against, we'll call them layup opponents, or third division opponents, or LCA, mm -hmm. bottom of the table opponents? Yeah, well, you are right. I did ask to talk about this. Um, I think that, obviously, everyone is different. Everyone's got their own opinions. Everyone's got this different expectations, whatever. That's, that's absolutely fine. Um, we have to respect that. But at the same time, um, just because you play in the first division, that doesn't make you a superhero, a superhuman, and some sort of untouchable person, you know? Um, my brother played in the second division B for many, many years, and Tercera División as well. And he played at Barca as well himself. And, you know, I've seen, seen Barca Academy players throughout the last 30, 40 years, really. And... Um, it's not that much different, you know, it's really not that much different. I mean, you've got the extraordinary players like Messi, obviously Ronaldo, Puyol, Xavi, um, you know, Benzema, etc. But the average player, there's not that much of a difference. I mean, you can see it with um, Oscar Mingueza, for example, now. I mean, Oscar Mingueza was playing at Barca B not that long ago, I mean, two or three months ago, and uh, he wasn't really excelling there. But then once he got promoted to the first team, around players of uh, more experience, a higher caliber, he's he's doing sort of okay. You know, he's not really too far off. Um, yeah, and on the point of yeah, on the point of Migueta, I, I, I've said it before, I'm okay to be wrong about him, but I, I certainly, for the last two years, never expected him to be in the Barca first team because I thought he was average in the third division. So I thought that you would see that he'd be a lifelong player at Sabadell or, you know, if, if someday in, uh, in eight, nine years, Barcelona do draw, you know, Yeda in the in the Copa del Rey, that he would be in that squad. That's what I expected from his career, but that's fine to, to shell mm -hmm. out yourself a good 10, 15 year career. But yet how now he, here he is playing in the Barca first team, as we mentioned, because once his teammates got a little more talented, so did he, or at least uh, in this case, a little more experience. But yeah, back to your point. 100%, 100%. And uh, I do think as well, there are so many extraordinary players that um, on, only make it to the second division. Um, they maybe have an injury when they are 17, 16 and, you know, players that may have been playing for, I don't know, Valencia or Mallorca or even Barca or Espanol. And then all of a sudden they get an injury and that cuts their progression. So someone who is healthier at the time would be able to, to make the jump. But ultimately, there's not really that much difference apart from the multimillionaire sort of superstars that you get. Obviously, granted, Barca should have gone to Cornellà and won the game easily. I understand. But at the same time, this is January. It's freezing cold. Um, it's a matter, uh, it, the game doesn't really matter that much to the Barca players um, in the you know, larger context of the season. But then you've got Cornellà, it's the game of the season for them. They know all the cameras are going to be on them. They know they're going to be watched all around the world. And it's the game of their lives. I mean, the Cornellà goalkeeper at 21 years old doing such a great game, that may be a life changing game for him you know there may be players uh, and scouts and colleagues and coaches all around the world and definitely in, in Spain that are going to be talking about him 
And I would be very surprised if next season the young goalkeeper named, so escapes me now, the 21 year old goalkeeper at Cornellà is there next season. I doubt it. And that's how much of a game can change your life. And uh, I think people need to put it into context. Um, just because you play, you play in Segunda División B or Tercera División, that doesn't mean you're you know, playing with one less leg than the others. Uh, you do compete and you know, motivation. And as we've been saying here, mental strength is incredibly important in every level. And if you prepare for the game and it's the game of your life, it is obvious it's going to be harder. I mean, they beat Atletico Madrid before us and Real Madrid are not in the cup anymore. Uh, they lost to Alcoyano. So really, it's not that easy to win. Yeah, and I, I think the important thing too, especially in the Copa del Rey, you listen to how many players on the opposition were in the Barca Academy at one point. The captain for Cornea was best friend with Victor Valdez in the academy now 18, 19 years ago. And, and he's still around the game. He's still playing and the experience he has of that. And to that point as well, but the, the level of third division players of what I've been seeing. And, you know, there's when you look back through the histories of the Copa del Rey, there are historic upsets. But in the last 10 years, we've actually seen more than ever before statistically where third division teams even give a good fight to first division teams. But to see Real Madrid upset in the way that they were, to see Atletico Madrid upset in the way they were, even to see the Segunda Division op teams, I mean, smashing Almeria, uh, completely smashing the first division opponents. And so even Barcelona's next rival in Real Vallecano, they slip by a bar as well. So those clubs aren't that different. Raya Vallecana, which is top five in the Segunda Division A, and a bar, which is uh, at this point, I don't know, either five or bottom seven or whatever it is in La Liga, the difference isn't that much. And I think one of the things that uh, I don't know how much of a percentage this goes into it, but the way technology has changed, whether it's scouting, in-game adjustments, which we know that Barcelona's manager, Ronald Koeman, doesn't necessarily make as many in-game adjustments as other no, as, I, as I look for tactical uh, breakdowns and differences. And we'll talk about the one rink we did at LJ uh, later, but I also wonder when it comes to Spain having led with, with the World Cup in 2010 and Pep Guardiola uh, creating this new revolution of football uh, and going all the way back to Johan Cruyff with the impact of rondos, just the technical ability that defenders and center backs now have. I mean, it was Cornea's back line, their defenders and their goalkeeper, that this was not a disservice to the Barca press, but you had these third division defenders and goalkeeper passing around Barcelona's first team players and getting out of pressure. And that is not an indictment of the press that Coleman is instituting. That is a fact that every player in Spain in particular, because they led that charge when it came to getting your defenders and, and goalkeepers a bit more technical and able to play with, with the ball at their feet a, a bit more, that's almost been a revolutionized or created a format across all of uh, all the different levels. I think of the same thing with the shooting drills. I mean, you and I are both big NBA fans. Think about a player like one of my favorites uh, 15 years ago was Sean Marion. The way that he would kind of, for those watching on YouTube, just shot, put the ball in. But I mean, the guy, I don't know what he is, but 36% or 38% from three point uh, land in his career. So it's not like he missed those shots. It was a shot that he was able to hit with, with a, a, a good amount of time. And even you have legends of the game that had Pete, uh, Pistol Pete Maverick. I think he had such a hitch in his shot. And yet he was such a good shooter or Rick Barry back in the 60s. Okay. Now I've gone too far, Frances. I'm coming back. And now you look at <laughs> I'm me. like that. We need you. Come back. Come back. <laughs> so now you, you look at those NBA players, especially the young ones in particular, shooting form is so consistent. And if a guy like a, a currently a LaMelo ball, if he shoots differently, everybody notices because it isn't uniform to what is currently happening with everyone. And as far as this, uh, the football has gone, as far as what, what we're watching, rondos and drills and the things seem to be similar as the way that trainings are set up now uh, because of advanced technology. And there's almost a, a universal medical agreement of how best to deal with your players, what recovery looks like. And those advances just get better and better from the first division to the third division if those third division teams can afford those kind of things. And yes, managing, and as you mentioned too, just wanting it, that desire is something that, you know, it, that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, but that extra desire that you see from these players, uh, as you mentioned, I think another point too, against Barcelona, why are these goalkeepers seemingly playing out of their mind this season mm -hmm. in particular? Well, I think that's because Barcelona are creating a ton of chances. As we see, the chances are way up in the last three years and Barcelona not having a number nine to create that kind of distraction in front of the goalies not like it's hockey, like you're shielding the goalies, but Ramon, Juan Ramirez and Edgar Badia just in the last week were both fantastic, but they also saw a ton of shots, a ton of chances. And just like a hockey goalie, if you see shots early and you're able to make those saves, it helps you a ton. 
And actually that gives more credit to the save that Ter Stegen made against Elche, where mm-hmm. he hadn't seen a single shot against him all game, comes out, times it perfectly, and gets a foot on it. So, so again, that's a testament to how good Ter Stegen is and why he's an elite goalkeeper compared to Ramon Juan Ramirez, who still let in two goals, Edgar Badia, who still let in two goals. But that's why these goalkeepers, to me, seemingly are having their best games ever against Barcelona. Exactly. I think that I've got a little to add. It's just to say that um, chances are what makes football what it is. Uh, and chances are what makes you win games. Um, there are teams like Atletico Madrid traditionally. Obviously, this season they're playing much, much better, to be honest. But the traditional Atletico Madrid, they don't really need to do much. But then they get a corner kick or they get a free kick from the side. They lob the ball in. They head it in. That's a win. And then they don't concede. Um, Barca cannot play like that. We're not a team that is built like that. And we've got different different strengths. And our strength is to play the ball around with as, as much speed as possible, pass it, be accurate, have the vision, run into the spaces and create those chances. Um, there's been a lot of criticism of Kuman this year. Um, and, you know, I am... Obviously, I saw him playing as a player, uh, which in a way makes me understand the background of where he comes from. But at the same time, if you're just judging for what you see, uh, he's a coach that is trying to instill what he believes in. Obviously, he will make mistakes. And it is clear that in terms of the amount of uh, playing time he gives the subs, um, in my opinion, should improve. And there are, you know, the stubbornness with a 4-2-3-1 at the beginning of the season. Um, there were things that we didn't always agree on. But what is clear is that he knows what he's doing. And what he is doing is making this team generate a lot of chances. Um, he was, after the Elche game, he was very keen on, and he has several questions as well, but in the press conference, he talked about the missing the penalties, the fact that it's unacceptable well, it is, you know, seven missed penalties already this season. Obviously, that's counting the ones in the Supercopa penalty shootout. But seven penalties missed, um, most of them from different players as well. Like pretty much everyone's had a go and a lot of people have actually missed it. And that is unacceptable. The amount of um, shots that Barca are taking and missing is also unacceptable. Um, the amount of sort of times that we get close enough to the area to take a a shot and the players choose to not shoot, that's also unacceptable. So there is a lot of room for improvement, but it is clear that Barca are playing well enough, especially lately, to get to those advantageous positions and those chances happen. We just need to put them away. I don't think we were actually as negative in that segment, Frances, as we could have been as far as <laughs> we need cranky, to change this down <laughs> as far as cranky as uh, as far as cranky about about some of the negativity around the club and the expectations. So I thought as far as the two opponents this week that Cornea was more prepared for Barca and Elche was less prepared, uh, which is, yeah. you know, as I said, interesting to say. But I thought that yeah. Barca's level actually lowered to what Elche were and they actually rose to what Cornea wanted from that match. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we also didn't even mention the, the, the artificial pitch, but I don't care about that. I, I, I messaged you when we were talking about the artificial pitch that, I mean, when I was playing um, my youth ball here in the U S I was so excited when other schools would have artificial turf because we played mm-hmm. in a, just a mud field. And so we were too busy slinging mud at each other to actually play on, uh, to actually play with the ball. So I was excited when the ball was actually moving <laughs> with a little bit of pace yep. on something to ground. And, uh, and I know, uh, especially in the U.S. here with the artificial turf, that you have Zlatan Ibrahimovic and Terry Henry. If you're 38, 40 years old, you don't want to play an artificial turf with, because of your knees. Totally understand that. But uh, the, cor- the Barcelona players, I mean, they were starting, you know, Ricky Puj, and they were starting young players. So I throw that out. Now, one of the players who didn't start against Cornea but did against Elche was Frankie de Jong, who was unequivocally the man of the match against LJ mm-hmm. and uh, you look at Barca without him. So, uh, I mean, even his, his form in, in the last month, Ibar at the end of December alongside Pjanic was his last poor match. And then following that, Huesca, Athletic Club, Granada, we also see dad, even Athletic Club the second time for him and LJ. He hasn't had an objectively bad game in a month. Finally, mm-hmm. after all this time, it's been a while. And I know it is just one month. And you can say that even that isn't a big sample size, but it's quite a few matches. We're talking about six matches in a matter of a month. And again, he didn't play against Cornea either. And I, I was on the Barca Match Center yesterday. And I mentioned there that my hope is that this is not just a good run of form for Frankie de Young. Like we've seen Antoine Griezmann. He's had basically two and a half good runs of form at FC Barcelona. And then he'll have three matches where he's kind of back to doing what he does. And for a goal scorer, it's a lot It's a lot easier to be able to understand that. But I think the eye test for Frankie de Young is that he is playing really, really well right now. 
And my hope is that that's actually just what he is for Barcelona now. What if this is actually yeah. Frankie de Jong? Because we know he's capable of this, but maybe this is who he is now for the, for the club. And that would be a great sign, not only for this season, but for beyond. For sure. Um, I think Frankie de Jong is pretty much the reason why Barca have hit consecutive wins and are, you know, much more often than not being able to keep clean sheets now. Um, I think that the young is not trying any harder this season than he was last season. I think we need to start from there. Uh, this is someone who from day one has been committed, um, someone who obviously is very young, but it's experienced already. Um, you know, he had a run with Ajax all the way to the Champions League semifinals, being a key driver at age 19 or 20 years old, uh, that is impressive. Um, getting to Barca, it was obvious, as Kuman said himself, that the first season was going to be for him to adapt. Um, unfortunately, neither one of the coaches he had last year were able to find his spot. Um, this season, when Kuman came on, pretty much everyone thought, okay, well, Kuman is here, he's from, from Holland, so he's going to make sure that Frankie de Jong is comfortable, and he's going to hit the ground running. That did not happen. Um, as I said already today, 4-2-3-1 was the formation that Kuman was going for. And what he was trying to do is just put Frankie next to Busquets. Uh, we thought it was going to be Pjanic or Busquets, but actually it seems to be just Busquets all the time. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about that later or another day. But anyway, alongside him as a double pivot, and that was stalling his creativity. He, wasn't, he didn't have enough freedom. He wasn't himself. Um, he was pretty much corseted, boxed into the middle of, of the pitch. And uh, that was very limiting. Now, as the season progressed, um, Kuman started playing around with the idea of shifting towards a 4-3-3, uh, which obviously is the traditional Barca system. Um, it, he took, I would say, three or four matches attempting and playing with it. And now I would say that he's decisively going for that. And as an interior midfielder, which pretty much is the position that Frankie played last year, but in a different set of circumstances, with different coaches, with different guidance, and with different teammates, vast majority of them are changed, if you think about it, then he's becoming the box-to-box -box midfielder that we all thought he could be. Um, he's much more free. He scored four goals this season already, which is more than double as he scored in the whole of the previous season. And he's been exceptional. You know, I, I think that... His ability to pass the ball around and to always find the open man is great. He had that last year. That's no difference. But I think that his conduction with the ball, his ability to dribble if, uh, if he's challenged, but not just that, he's breaking those lines and causing sort of numerical advantages and spaces around him. That's, that's what the difference is. Plus, his confidence level has risen. And now he, obviously, in the answers of Messi, it's easier to do. He's able to go into the striking position when needed. And uh, I think that... You know, he gets very hard pressed a lot of the time, but the fact that he's Griezmann up front um, is actually enabling him because he's so unselfish. I'm talking about Griezmann here. He can vacate that position for, for Frankie to go and, as we saw in the last game, assist or score himself. Yeah, that's the point, too. I think it's twofold of what has changed with Frankie de Jong now in the last few matches that we had never seen before. And one of those, as you mentioned, with that formation change, we thought on paper, and you and I discussed this in the summertime, that having Busquets and De Jong in a double pivot, on paper at least, it meant that when De Jong got the ball and had space to dribble into, because if that was the case and Barca were sitting in those positions, that there should be room in the midfield to, to, to rush into and dribble with the ball and do what he does really well with it. And that space just wasn't there because it was either Messi not dropping deep or when Griezmann did, it would just be to recycle the ball. And so it was a lot of Barcelona were moving the ball slowly. Busquets clearly wasn't comfortable because he had spent his whole career playing as a single pivot, and now he's playing as mm -hmm. a double pivot. Now that they've gone to back to basically Busquets quarterbacking that that uh, that that attack, if you will, especially when Barca have possession. And yes, the answers of our Barcelona cut out on the counter. That's an entirely different conversation we'll talk about <laughs> at another time. But offensively is what we're speaking about here. That Busquets then is back to his single pivot where he belongs, and that allows De Young to make those runs that we credited Paulinho with, a Turvey doll. And now De Jong has become that player. And we never really thought of him as that kind of player. But I think one of the weaknesses that he does have in his game is that De Jong does not move the ball quickly in the way that one touch passing that we see from Danny Alves or Busquets. And we've even seen occasionally from Dest where De Jong is much more methodical with the ball and not in a necessarily antithetical, like 
it's not necessarily a bad thing for Barcelona. He actually reminds me of Bacaro back in the, in the day and the, the timing and pace at which he moved the ball. There isn't a, there isn't a, a pausa as there was with Iniesta or Xavi, but there is a much more methodical approach kind of blending his, I mean, superior technical ability on the ball with his physical gifts. I mean, being able to use everything he has in those iron lungs. And so those runs into the uh, boxes you're mentioning are important. And I think the point is why, if he was an in interior last year and he's interior this year, why weren't those runs coming? And I think the answer comes down to Suarez for Griezmann, as you mentioned as well, that Suarez yeah. wasn't going to be moving or vacating from that space that, that De Jong is now dribbling into. And De Jong, in particular, when he's playing with confidence, is able to ride tackles much, much better. And so instead of trying to recycle the ball as he was in that 4-2-3-1, he is turning. And once he gets, after he rides one tackle and gets into that free space in the middle of the field, Griezmann is checking back to him or making a run for him that Suarez wouldn't, wouldn't make. And so De Jong is dribbling into that space now, which is what he did so well for Ajax. And if he doesn't have the ball or he gives off the ball, he continues that run as Paulinho and Vidal did. So it's taking different parts of his game and maximizing things that we didn't know he did well. But as I said, the issue always with him is that against Elche, for the first about 10, 15 minutes, Barcelona were not moving the ball well, and De Jong wound up being quite stagnant. And so if De Jong is going to be kind of standing around and not fully taking the game by its horns, then Barca are going to stall. That's how important he's become now to Barca's makeup. But when he's clicking and he's getting himself into the places he needs to be, running into those spots or turning and getting into space, dribbling into space rather, and opening everything up for everybody else, then Barcelona are so much better. So it's been exciting to me to see him become a staple of what Barcelona are doing well, but also keeping in mind, same thing with Busquets, that there are certainly downsides and weaknesses that um, proper opponents are going to try to exploit. But I think that was going to happen with no matter how tough of a player you are. Same thing with Messi. If you can try to make uh, weaknesses out of some of your opponent's strength, then the opposition will do that. But as I said, I've been, a, as they say, a stand for De Young all the way. And I said, please be patient. Please be patient. And I'm really hoping this is what we see now. And uh, Frances, I, I know I'll let you finish the De Young point here, but I also want you to transition here with your next point. Speaking of patience, um, Ricky Pooj scored his first goal with the first team. But how about you answer De Young first? And then you can go off on Ricky Pooj. I was going to, I was going to, I was just going to say that um, I like the layered midfield that we have. I don't know if many people have thought about this one, but basically you use the word quarterback, which I think is quite appropriate. You've got Busquets, who is the one that holds, um, having a much more, well, his traditional area of influence, to be honest, uh, just alone, not by the double pivot, is, is helping him. I would say the second layer is the young, uh, normally holding position, but then when he can just zooming forward and I think Pedri is the key to that midfield um, I know this is obvious but Pedri is 18 years old he is a kid you know he was 17 two months ago let's put that into context you know like I I disagree I see... he looks 38 though if you look 38 <laughs> maybe maybe you are 38 I don't know <laughs> Yeah, that, that again, we're living a lot of points for a different day, but this is certainly one for a different day, the way that Pedri looks. But the way he plays, Dan, right, um, right. <laughs> is, is like he's 38 as well, isn't it? He's right. super experienced um, in, in his head. He's an old man in his head. He tends to see the plays that many people don't see. And I was watching the game against Celtic thinking, what is this guy going to be like in seven years if he continues to play the amount of minutes as he's playing? You know, and we could be, I think that it's very difficult to disagree that we could be looking at a midfielder for Barca for the next 14 years in Pedri, you know, and uh, the way that he is crucial to everything that Barca does, um, I don't know if many people are understanding and I don't think many people want to see it because they want to see Ricky Puig doing so well, uh, you know, like I... I I've been seeing some conversations. I've seen, oh, Pedri is playing too much. Give Puig more minutes. Well, yes, because, you know, Pedri has been playing a lot of minutes the same way that, I don't know, Griezmann has been playing a lot of minutes, the same way that Frankie himself has been playing too many minutes. And I think that Kuman is taking too long to make those substitutions. Um, if I was him, um, I would probably have an alarm on my phone around the 60th minute and say, right, get the people warmed up so that they can come in in the 65th or 70th minute tops. But um, in too many occasions, and especially, you know, you think about it, the last four games, we've played 120 minutes twice. Uh, then we had a midweek game, which was incredibly challenging in Cornellà that also went over. And then you've got um, the last game against Elche two or three days later. So these players that are starting 
pretty much regularly now gives the team consistency, obviously, but, you know, I don't want to be getting to March, um, March, April time and having everyone sort of burnt out. And um, hopefully we're still competing for hopefully three competitions by then. Um, I don't know how far we'll go in the Champions League, but then again, things are looking up. So who knows? Um, Copa del Rey, I think we've got a, we've got a good run. Um, normally, as we spoke about a little bit last week, I wouldn't consider the Copa del Rey a priority, but this year I think is the most feasible trophy that we can win. So we, that, I think we really need to push for that one uh, more than in any other season, to be honest. And uh, I think in La Liga, you know, we're seven, depending on what Atletico does, obviously, but we could be seven to 10 points behind Atletico. I think that's, that's tricky. But at the same time, um, we need to make sure that our players are rested so, for what was coming. So you said about Puch. Delighted that he took responsibility in the Supercopa. Delighted that he seemed so confident and he knew where he was going to take the penalty and he slotted it past, was really confident and that was, he was delighted, obviously. Um, great to see how much of a Barca, a Barca fan at heart he is. He's a culé through and through, that's clear. And um, obviously you could see him yesterday, you know, coming on and in two minutes he scored. Um, obviously, he seems to be quite lucky in the sense that, you know, after, scoring after a minute isn't something that most people can do, but, you know, it went his way. He was at the right place at the right time. I am delighted for him, but I think that we need to stop trying to counter the lack of push minutes against Pedri himself because they are totally compatible. I would love to see them play together and they are on a different journey and that journey is, um, is decided by the coach and the coach is playing Pedri right now. We've spoken about the young. You can't really take him out right now unless he's going to be rested. Um, but then again, he cannot really be rested because we're still behind in La Liga and we probably will be for the season. Hopefully I'm wrong. And you cannot really play, in my opinion, the Busquets role with Ricky. So he needs to be a sub. I just hope that he gets more minutes so that hopefully he can compete for a starting position soon. But I don't think he's ready just yet. Yeah, I think on the point of, of Ricky Puj, it goes, it all kind of works in tandem. It has nothing to do with Puj or Pedri. Uh, and much to do with Coleman, in, in fact, and not on the personal level. But the fact is that Puj is the backup to Pedri, and that's okay if Puj is getting regular minutes as the backup to Pedri. Now, the yeah. problem here is I know he's 18, but Pedri has played more games, not more minutes, but he's played more games than any other player for Barca this season. So that does worry you that an 18-year-old is going to burn out having played more football than he's ever played before. We were saying the same thing with Ansu Fadi before his injury, that there was a worry that Ansu Fadi was going to uh, yeah, it might not be an issue in the next five to seven years, but all of a sudden he might look a little bit like Wayne Rooney where he's 27, 28 years old. And because he plays such high level football at 16 and 17, he's going to wear down a lot quicker. So the answer would be with, with Pedri, the same fear would come. It's not going to be Coleman's problem because he's going to be eight years with Barcelona in the rear view mirror. By the time Pedri starts, you start to see some of the, we'll say negative effects of playing an 18 year old like this for so long. So my hope is, yeah, that, that Puj was able to start in place of Pedri at times as he did against Cornea. And even though we come out at, at, after 45 minutes, it seems like he's not to say back in the plans a bit, but with Coutinho out, now Puj is finally getting comfortable in that role coming off the bench for Pedri. And Pedri is now just the starter as the interior because you're not worrying about where to fit Coutinho, uh, at, which is going to continue to be the problem when Coutinho comes back, which is a shame that you have a player who just knowing that he's returning creates issues with the squad and minutes and rotation and all those different things. So, I, yeah, I'm delighted that Puj got the, the goal. But more importantly, I'm delighted that, yes, I think Trincao had his best minutes against Elche of the season, not just the two goals, but he added something to that match. You, you felt that when he came on, I believe it was the 74th, and then Puj, yeah, came on in the 87th. But when those two were on the field then in the 87th minute, the reason why Puj scored in the final three minutes of the match was because he added and injected not just reckless energy, as you've spoken about in the past, where he's kind of running around like a chicken with his head cut off, but he actually added something to the match in terms of giving it a different flavor that Elche weren't ready for. And if Puj can change a match like that in the same way that when Ansu Fadi was healthy and Dembele, before he got hurt the... I don't know what time, the ninth time, the 10th time, whatever it was, before he got hurt the last time <laughs> since he's been back, he was coming off the bench and changing matches. And he was our difference maker. And if Pooj can come off, uh, come on uh, onto the field in the last 14 to 18 minutes of a match and be a difference maker, then that's exactly who he is for Barcelona this year. And it is no, there's nothing wrong with his career if he is a bench player coming off 
and playing, you know, if he can get 1200 minutes in a season next year or 1500 minutes in a season by coming off the bench at the age of 22, now that's okay. Right. If he's 21, like he is this year and not playing at all and only playing 18 minutes in six months, that's a problem. But if he can come off the bench and play 1200 to 1500 minutes next year, now we're talking about a different career and it's okay that he's not uh, in the, in the starting lineup forever. And he has to earn that spot fair. And it may be just not with Pedri and that might even allow an, a next coach to do different things by to play those two together. And maybe yes, one day drop De Young into a pivot role occasionally or whatever it may be. There's a lot of different things you can do. Pedri could be a little bit on the wing as a left attacking midfielder and Fati a little bit closer to the top in a four, four, two, whatever it may be, let the next coach decide that we know what Coleman's doing at the moment, but yeah, for Pooj, I don't want to overthink it because it's, it's a good sign. And I'm more, I'm more excited. I think even about, the thing, the wrinkle that he added to that game than I am even about his goal. And even the goal itself, it showed not only passion for the crest, sure, you can you can call it that, but a player that understands how to make an impact. And the fact that he ran straight through the two LJ defenders, he wasn't unmarked. He, he still had some work to do on the back post. And mm-hmm. yeah, he's short, so people were making fun of how high he got up in the air, but he did. I mean, there was ambition, he wanted it, and he got his goal. And so, and you could see his teammate, Jordi Alba, Griezmann, they were all delighted for him because he cares and he wants to be part of the team. So I, I think the whole thing between Komen and Pooj is overblown. Obviously, we've talked about it before because constantly we're discussing attitude and Todibo, Dembele, no matter who it is, Umtiti. And, and again, you're catching the theme there on those. Now, Todibo may be the one exception, but we're not going to talk about that this week. We'll talk about Todibo and the lone guys in another show. But the point is about Pooj. I never really thought it was attitude. I just thought it was a matter of a kid who was kind of refusing to go out on loan and get consistent minutes as a starter, but a player who wanted to fight for his spot. And, you know, when Sergio Roberto did this a few years ago, um, Lucho didn't make such a big deal about it. Instead, he put him at right back and he wound up having a new career, that being Sergio Roberto. But because Coleman is just a little more stubborn in press conferences or says a little bit more of what he's thinking than, uh, than Lucho necessarily did, now all of a sudden Puj and Coleman are at odds and it's this terrible conflict. But I don't think that's it. I think Puj actually had to earn his minutes and now he's earned his minutes. And so now there's really no problem to me. Uh, do you have anything else to add there? Because I do want to talk about uh, another one of the young players who played this week. Yeah, no, not on that. Just to say that I am very pleased that Kuman is the way he is in press conferences. I think that these, these, this squad uh, needed what he's getting. This squad needed someone who is strong, charismatic, and can tell the players what's what, basically. And he's not afraid to not throw the players under the bus, but just speak to the press conference uh, and, and, you know, the different media gathered in there in the best possible way, in the most honest way that he can. And uh, I think that the Baca Sagrada's time is slowly but surely getting to an end and he's playing whoever he feels is best for the team. So I think that's, that's good as well. Yeah, I mean, I, we still have critiques of his substitutions and his sure. substitution pattern, especially second half. So first half of matches, I mean, when it comes to his starting 11s, I have very few complaints about who he chooses to begin matches with. Um, and so the substitutes are the problem, where even against LJ, he used two of the five subs after the 75th minute. And that was a match I was calling out for a winger. And it, it, mm-hmm. it, it seems like a detail because now we're talking about the 18th player. And it sounds like I'm just going crazy about the academy products. But I saw Barcelona B, they beat Olat yesterday, and I, I wrote a little match review up there. I'm gutted, I, I have to mention, for the 19-year-old right back, Suji Rosanes, came back mm-hmm. after five months from a dislocated shoulder and winds up, we don't know what the exact injury is, but it's probably a long-term knee injury. I'm completely gutted for him. He played three minutes before going down, um, and Barcelona B were able yeah. to, after Can I stop you then, Dan, yeah, yeah. because we've gone full circle. If he has an injury that is long-term, like you're mostly guessing or predicting, yeah. He may end up playing in a Segunda División team. Right. He may end up playing a Segunda División B team. He may be playing a Cornellá. So in 10 years' time, whatever team he ends up in plays Barca, is it really that much difference in quality? It isn't. Right. You know, it is a player developing that somehow gets an injury and somehow doesn't make it into the Spanish national team. That's yeah. not to say he's a bad player. Right, exactly. Yeah, right. Because he, I wouldn't say he's a top, top. He's not Alejandro Balde type potential, Mm -hmm. but he could be, I mean, he's considered in the same line as a Sergio Roberto, you know, Mm -hmm. as as we talk about in the academy. He's he's 19 at the moment. So yeah, got it for him. But one of the players missing from that Barca B match was Conrad De La Fuente. And again, I know he's 18 or 19. He makes the first team bench and that's exciting for him. But I was always, I was wondering that if Barca, their A team and their B team are playing uh, at the same time, 
my, my question is, you have a match against LJ that's calling out for a winger. That's what it needed. Brothwaite had to come off for a winger, and, and that was what was going to break LJ down, right? And yet Busquets gets a yellow card. He'll miss Athletic Club, uh, which is, I can think, more a, a more important game than even – I'm not sure who's after that, but now Busquets is out because he was getting tired and Coleman didn't take him out. And for Conrad de la Fuente, he winds up sitting on the bench again this and then and not playing at Barcelona B. So my point is, I don't need to make, he doesn't need to be a first team player. I'm not yelling for him to have first team minutes. What I'm saying is, I mean, at his age too, he's 19 as well. He needs to be playing. So let him play with Barca B. If, if against Elche in a match where you need a winger, when you're up one goal or when you're up two nothing, if that's not right for, if that's not the proper situation, then there's no situation to bring him onto the field. So let him play with Barca B. I, I just like, that's the other point that puzzles me. If you're going to use two of five subs, and you clearly have a tired team where Busquets gets a yellow card. And same thing against Cornea, where Alice Callado, who has been the best player in the third division, who was the best player against Cornea five weeks ago, he doesn't even feature in that match either. Then, and not say why call him in an, in at all, because Barca B didn't have any match at that time. But it's just puzzling to me uh, how Brothwaite wound up playing what was what almost 210 minutes in, 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 a, in a week and a half, because for some reason, Brothwaite had to be on the field for all those things, even though against Elche, he was playing as a winger and he wasn't really just dis- dis- disrupting anything as a nine. It was Griezmann who was having to take the burden of being that number nine. Um, yeah. And Brothwaite, he was better against Elche. His cross led to the first goal. Um, but I thought, I mean, he was so poor against Cornet. He should have come out in that match. And uh, it's just a point of for Brothwaite. I wouldn't be frustrated if he hadn't played 210 minutes. If Brothwaite had played 130 minutes, then that's fine. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the point is, I, I think, for me, Frances, I mean, you're always uh, good about putting me in my place in terms of yelling about the kids or you know, <laughs> don't don't overhype them. But I'm not overhyping their talent because Kayato is already better than Cornea and he's the one that beat them the first time. So he's good enough to and he, he made his first team debut two years ago. Right. It's not like mm-hmm. he's unknown. He's 20. He's almost 22 years old. Right. Mm-hmm. So my question is just it's if it's Coutinho or Kayato, I understand why Coutinho is playing. If it's Pedri against Kayato, I understand why Pedri's playing. Same thing down the line. But if you're not bringing these guys on when you have five subs and you're only using one or two and you're playing a, a three straight extra time games for the first time since 1928, then why aren't these these, these players playing? And I say that as you're going to respond, and then I'm going to have to talk about Ies Mariba. So I'm going to eat crow a little bit because Ies Mariba started <laughs> against Cornea. But um, my, my point still stands on those other guys about Conrad against LJ and why those substitutions are not being used um, in matches that against LJ, Barcelona should have won 2-0 instead of that one ending 1-1. But for 20 mm-hmm. minutes, I thought it was going to be 1-1. So something had to change. And he got Trincao and Puj right, but he certainly could have got even two or three other players right as well. Yeah, it is really hard to understand why the subs are taking so long to, to be made. Uh, this is something that Setien used to do as well. And we didn't understand it at the time. Yeah. To credit to Valverde, he seemed to get his subs right most of the time, yeah. uh, which is probably one of the very few things we can say about Valverde at this moment in time. But he got his but, start um, wrong. That was Valverde's problem, where he couldn't get it right at the beginning. He would be, exactly. out- he would be outmatched in the beginning, and then exactly. yeah, he would figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, one of these days we'll get a coach that can do everything. You know, right, let's, right. let's see. Let's see what happens. But no, um, they, 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 well, in this case, Kuman is taking way too long to, to make the substitutions. I, it's undefensible. I don't understand why a young player will be called up and not playing. Obviously, from the larger perspective, you think, okay, so this is a team that could help the first team. The first team is so much more important than the second team. Uh, this, in Conrad's case, he's training with the first team the vast majority of the time. He is what they call in, in Catalonia Dinamica de Primer Equipo, which is first team dynamics. He's traveling, he's getting used to it. And, you know, in the longer run for Conrad, it may be more useful. This is probably, I, I don't agree with this, but I'm thinking this is what they're thinking. It is more beneficial for him to get used to not just the playing, but also the, 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 the whole match day dynamics and, and the being in the dressing room, you know, being seen alongside Messi and the rest of the stars in the first team, that they're probably thinking this is more beneficial for him in the long run than, again, with all due respect, against a lot uh, in freezing Catalonia. Um, but from, from a personal perspective, I don't quite understand it. I think that young players have to play. I mean, we've been saying that about Ricky Puig the whole year, so I'm not going to change my tune now. I think that young players have to play. Um, Callado, obviously, had an injury last year that was really serious. But um, it seems that that's in the past. Um, so I'm hoping that he will be in the first team soon. But then again, if Trincao comes on for, you know, the 97th millionth time this season as a sub, 
but for the probably the first time he's got more of an impact, then that's another positive that's going to make Alex's journey to the first team a little bit harder. But, you know, plus, 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 everything that I said is a positive, but apart from the fact that Conrad is just sitting there. But, you know, I think there's enough wins in the last, not wins as in games, but there's enough, enough little gains in, the, in so many aspects in the last two, three weeks that uh, it's hard to criticize right now. But no, I don't, I don't understand why Conrad would just sit there for the whole probably two, two weeks. No, don't get it. Yeah, yeah, right. So I think for Coleman, again, so much credit is deserved to him for what he's done with the youth. So it sounds silly that I'm complaining about time and minutes for youth players while he's done all these things with Dest out of necessity. I think Magueta arguably out of necessity. Fati was Barcelona's best player before he got injured. Pedri, uh, I, maybe he would have done this for every manager, but certainly we never expected Pedri to be this good. He's gotten now the best out of the young. So it's not like I can complain too much about, I mean, even even Ricky Pooch is still a part of the first team, right? So as much as I'm, I'm frustrated about, I was frustrated about Carlos Alenia's time with the first team, and now he's out on Lona Hadafe. So I'm splitting hairs at the end of that bench there. Uh, even the rotation, the revival of Umtiti, he's only played five of, times this season but the two 90 minute appearances were the four nothing against Granada and then they had Elche and I thought he was very good in both because he delivers the ball and passing the ball better than any other center back in the first team including Gerard Piquet but Gerard Piquet overall around a better player and I, I mean as far as the situational ways that Piquet plays the ball uh I, Piquet is obviously a far superior player but I think Titi and his passing is, just, is really really good um and yeah he has his defensive issues he seems to slip once a game <laughs> and LJ weren't able to, to put Barcelona on, on the back foot because of that. But yeah, I've been pleased that MTT has been able to be reintegrated into the first team in that way, particularly mm-hmm. when Langley has been in such terrible form. So to be able to put MTT against LJ and Langley can sit on the bench and rotate in that manner and to and stow your team and the whole player, it's not just Coleman isn't using 12 to 13 players. He actually is trying to extend his bench a little bit, including to use MTT. Uh, and it is, he's reaping the benefits of it because Barcelona, believe it or not, have 20 first team, I mean, La Liga quality players. So you can take all 20 of your players around the first team dynamic and put them in against LJ. And you didn't expect that they're going to play well uh, unless yep. they're having a bad day. So I, I've been excited to see the revival of MTT. Uh, why don't you respond to them? Yeah, finally, I'm going to get to ES Moriba. No, just to say that um, all that agreed. And also the, the rise and rise and rise of Araujo. Araujo is doing fantastically well. Um, again, he looks like he's been there for 20 years playing a centre-back. Um, he's obviously very young. He's very fresh. He's very strong. He's got a great presence. He's strong in the air. And uh, he's making, luckily, less and less mistakes all the time. He's even yeah. dangerous in the other end and uh, contributing, you know, at, in attack, which, you know, is something that we some, somehow need. If we are going to win any title, not this year, but in the future, we need our centre-backs to be getting some goals here there uh, from free kicks, from corners, for whatever. And I think Araujo seems like the real deal right now. Um, I still think Gerard Piqué is better on the ball than Umtiti, but I agree with you in the sense that Umtiti is uh, a second-best option from the back in my eyes in terms of playing the ball. And I think that his criteria on the ball, his vision and his decision-making is better than Lenglet's, which is why... You know, if he can keep his fitness, uh, this is Umtiti I'm talking about, obviously, then, you know, he's in contention to be a starter, especially with Piquet being out. So another three bits of positive news. I think we are, yeah. we're getting this wrong today, Dan. Say something bad. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't even think I could disagree with the Piquet point. I think you said decision-making, and that's the difference between Umtiti and Piquet. I think Umtiti has the mm-hmm. ability to play a better ball, but Piquet's mm-hmm. decision-making is so much better, so his passing is superior in that, in that fashion. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we are talking and being very positive about all those different things because it's true that Coleman is extending a squad, and it, it, feels, it, it properly feels like the transition here it's supposed to be. It's supposed to fill you with hope for next season. Another one of those was he gives a debut to Ies Mariba. He gets, he gets called up to first-team training, and then he starts against Cornea, where, as I had mentioned on last week's show, that was his best, for me, the best match he'd played this season was against Cornea. What I am seeing, though, and a similar thing with Araujo, but a little different here. My point on Araujo is he's exactly the player that we expect him to be. And he even played as a center forward uh, back in, in Uruguay when he was a youngster. So just like Gerard Piquet in that fashion. Now, Araujo is not going to surprise anybody with uh, his, his ball playing. But I think that's my issue with Langley and Araujo and continues to be that Araujo is a problem if you put another Araujo next to him. But if you put a ball playing center back 
uh, whether it is Umtiti or Gerard Piquet or it is Eric Garcia, whoever it may be, if you put a ball playing center back next to Araujo, my hope is that they're going to complement each other in the ways that Puyol and PK did, in the ways that Mascherano and PK did. So it's hard to compare um, those two, and even go back to Coleman's days. Coleman was that ball playing center back, and then whoever it was, whoever it was at that time, yes, they played three at the back often, but um, I, I I wouldn't say that any of the players that were necessarily next to him, because for that now I'm off in the weeds here, but it was arguably Pep Guardiola because he dropped so deep. He was basically playing as that center back in that fashion. But anyway, we're in the weeds there. But the point is you can have a non ball playing center back for FC Barcelona. If you have someone around him to complement his abilities. And my hope is that that is exactly what Barcelona are going to figure out here moving forward. Now, for the point of ES Mariba, I'm seeing a lot of kickback in the same way that I think people expect Araujo to be PK because he's not, he's, well, on the Rahu, he's different. He's in anything, he's more like Puyol than he is, or Mascherano than he is. Agreed. Uh, well, yep. Mascherano was great on the ball as well. But the point is, he, he, he's not PK. Now, Mariba, I think because people saw Iash's highlights when he scored that hat trick, the, the, the one from midfield against Real, uh, I mean, uh, Real Madrid. Can't even remember their name. I hate them so much. So uh, again, <laughs> against Real Madrid, when he was like, I mean, he was like 13 or 14 years old for whatever it was the kid at odds, he winds up scoring from midfield. And I think he had a hat trick in that match as well. And so now you're obviously just seeing the highlights. And whenever you see highlights of these kids who are 13, 15, 16, whatever it is, you obviously see all their attacking skills. And Ias Mariba was the biggest and most athletic player when he was 12 years old, 13 years old, 14 years old, 15 mm-hmm. years old, 16 years old, right? Now that he's playing against grown men in the third division, he looks like the athlete that he is, which is one among many. He's still one of the better athletes in that division, but it's not like he can use his athletic ability to just completely dominate a game in the way that he used to. And so now what he is as a professional, he is much more a box-to-box midfielder. He is much more a midfielder that gets into the flow of the game. He's good on tackles, though. That's something he's very solid. He winds up going box-to-box, and he is much more... I see, I don't want to actually use a name. I don't want to use a comparison because I think it's unfair to him because we don't know exactly what he is. He just turned 18 as well. So he's a player that can get forward, can get a shot off. He has that ability, but also he can, again, get stuck in a tackle. To me, he seems like, I I think his potential would be a better version of Paulinho. To me, that's what he looks like at the moment. Just a guy that has a workhorse and go from one to another, but he also has that ability to move the ball quickly, one touch, like you expect any Barca midfielder to. So when we look at his ceiling, I think it's very still, it not only is it still very high, but it's high in a way that people aren't expecting it to be. As in the player that everyone seems to think he's going to be is not what he profiles as. So if you expect him to have the potential, the player he's profiling as, he could be one of the best versions of that in the world. But if you expect him to be Paul Pogba or whoever player that is a player that somebody else is going to throw out there who's never watched him, then you're going to confuse the player that he is. So my point is that you can call all these young kids the next Messi, or you can call Ies Mariba the next Paul Pogba. But the problem is those comparisons don't make any sense if that's not the player that they are. So Kylian Mbappe, when he's coming up, if you wanted to compare him to any other speedster, center forward, who is, you'd use his speed unequivocally to be one of the best goal scorers in the world, compare him to that. If you want to compare Erlen Holland, and I'm going to have a YouTube video on this in a few weeks now, but Erlen Holland, people are saying, oh, he's not Barca. He doesn't fit Barca because he profiles as a Van Nistelrooy type player. And you've labeled him based on this legend that played 20 years ago. And now you expect that he is that guy. But Ies Mariba isn't that guy. So just take him as Ies Mariba and you'll be excited by what he's doing and not necessarily think that he is just this average player because he's not doing the things that the internet told you that he did. Well, what people cannot forget is that he's got a lot of competencia. There's a lot of people going from the same amount of places and uh, they're very, very limited. I mean, in a 4-3-3, which, you know, we cannot really argue is the Barca system in the long run, which is hopefully what uh, Moriba is going to be in the first team for. If he's not a holding midfielder as in a Busquets position, then there's two interiores that one of them is quite likely going to be for the young for the next 10 years. The other one is possibly going to be for Pedri. Then you've got Ricky Puig, you've got Alanya possibly coming back. Um, obviously, in the next couple of years, hopefully you've got Pjanic making an impact and, and you know getting some decent playing time as well. Um, whoever is signed, Coutinho coming back maybe. Um, so there's a lot of people that are going for those two places. And, you know, it doesn't matter how many words you type on Twitter. It doesn't matter how many capital letters you write on Instagram. That doesn't change what reality is. And reality is, is that not 
your 20 favorite La Masia players cannot make it to the first team. Not even your top three Barca players from La Masia can make it into the Barca starting 11. So something has to give at some stage, you know, like two, three years ago, people were going crazy for Denis Suarez to play or Rafinha to play or Malcolm to play. Well, not everyone can play a Barca and, you know, only the best of the best of the best in terms of quality, in terms of um, dressing room dynamics, in terms of um, background politics, all of these matters and people don't really see it. Um, in terms of uh, resilience and, and most importantly, what you perform like when you go on the pitch. I mean, like Ricky Butch in the last week, he's played three minutes, he scored a goal. Well, people notice that. So that is the way forward. And Ilesh Moriba is just 18. He is beginning to play with the first team and you know, we don't really know what's, what's going to happen there, but all, all steps are going in the right direction. And I would just wish him all the best for the future. And hopefully we can see him succeed at the first team, but that's not a guarantee. Yeah. Another reason guys don't necessarily fit. And this is our, our last quick topic here. Again, it's going to be a few moments here. Uh, it's money. Sometimes players are sold who could fit like Malcolm. Maybe he could have done well in, a, in, in another season, but money wise, the club needed to sell him. So they had to get him off the books. And speaking of money, the club's official accounts were released. And the trouble we knew was the trouble we can see now. So we can actually see the numbers. For the 2019-20 season, there was reported 128 million euro pre-tax loss as revenue dropped 14% from 852 million euros to 729 million euros. And the profit on player sales fell from 107 million euros to 73 million euros. I think that's also as other teams kind of realized that Barca were desperate to, to get off the, on their players and so or to, to get rid of their players. And so they, they got themselves in trouble. The gross debt, including transfers, was up 48% to 820 million euros. So that's the one that you circle. Barcelona had 820 million euros of debt. And we knew that COVID and we knew the pandemic, Bar Bartomeu, as much as he, he lied and said some slimy things, uh, he was telling the truth when he said that COVID was a big problem. And they, have, they, were, they would have, Barcelona has said that they would have posted a 2 million euro profit. Instead, it's 120 million euro loss instead. So that's your difference. So a negative 126 million uh, variable that COVID added to that equation. Uh, they also, oh, this is the worrying sign for me. And this is where you really do pin it on Bartomeu and that board. They owe 19 clubs, a total of 126 million euros for outstanding payments on transfers. The largest sum they still owe any team is 20, 29 million euros owed in the short term to Liverpool for Felipe Coutinho. And that 126 million euros owed by the club is just short-term money if you count all the money. So that being future payments owed for Coutinho, adding up to all 40 million euros. Now you're talking about 196 million euros overall owed to other clubs for players. So when you wonder why Barcelona, if they're haggling over 1 million euro for Eric Garcia, that's the reason. Because Barcelona have gotten their transfer policy. We knew that they've got it wrong. We were frustrated by Griezmann. Coutinho, even Dembélé, because of the amount that he he was he was he was worth about sixty million, and Dortmund got one hundred and twenty million out of Barca for Dembélé. So he was worth a lot, but he wasn't worth that much. And the list goes on and on. Mateus Fernandez. I mean, it's again the final nail in the coffin, and it's unfair that I keep mentioning him because you you can mention Douglas too. You can mention Artur Vidal. You can mention the swap between Artur, Artur and Pjanic, where with these finances, as well we're seeing that. That saved Barcelona, I think it was 160 million euros because they were able to spread out Pjanic and basically put their problems off for the future. So Arter was, as we, as we knew the whole time, he wasn't great in the locker room and we knew that. He didn't necessarily mess with what was happening at Barcelona. He had injuries as well. Uh, but that deal was done for financial reasons. And he just wound up, because of the other things, being the scapegoat, being the perfect person to swap for Pjanic. So I mean, Francis, I don't know how much more you could add to this because this is just the money. But as I said, it's we knew there was, this was a problem. And this is actually about the numbers that we knew that Barca were, were in such big problem. This is why Goldman Sachs comes up. Well, this is a podcast. And unfortunately, silence is not going to be very popular with our listeners. So I'm not going to be quiet, which is what I would love to do at this moment in time. Um, because basically, I've got very little words to describe the situation that we're in. Um, I do get that coronavirus has accepted, has affected everything around the world and, you know, the vast majority of businesses, apart from those that profited from the situation, but, you know, that's another topic for a different day. Um, vast majority of football and sport clubs around the world, they've lost money. Um, but the one that seems to be having the biggest hole is Barca. 
So I don't cannot really count that as an excuse. I think that has to be put on Bartomeu on his ball for, for very poor management. Um, also, I don't think the numbers that we see today are real. Uh, I think the numbers that I would trust are the numbers that are brought up by the next president once the, the carpets have been lifted and uh, there's been a proper cleanup. Um, I'm not doubting that Tusquets is giving reliable information, but obviously his alliances lie with the guy before him. Um, obviously the colors of the club as well, but he was there with the previous, um, you know, with Bartomeu and, and co. So you really need to take everything that is published until the new president comes with a pinch of salt. And uh, as I've been saying for the last five, six months, cannot wait for the next president to come in, uh, whoever that may be. Obviously, we haven't really discussed this for a couple of weeks now, but obviously the delay of the election is not helping anybody. But um, I think it was something that it was inevitable based on the fact that the authorities were recommending it. Um, obviously, you can always, in hindsight, not that we didn't have this side at the time, but in hindsight, you can say the election should have happened before. I mean, we were screaming <laughs> to the heavens and, and back down um, about that happening, didn't happen, and now it's too little, too late. And you know, the club is basically wasting another month, month and a half in, in doing something that should have been done. Um, could affect us in the long run moving forward in terms of signings, et cetera. But, you know, as we are saying and looking at the, at the numbers you just gave, um, it is unlikely there's going to be any signings. Um, Kuman already reportedly said that to the dressing room this, this season. They said, he said, um, we are the ones we are. So take care of yourselves because the, the ride's going to be long yeah. and you're basically all going to be needed. And, uh, you know, in the long run, that could be a blessing in these guys. Who knows? Uh, because, you know, there's no other option but to give the youngsters uh, yep. playing time. And to be honest, that's not too bad, really, in a season that, as we say pretty much every week, I don't think we're going to win much at all. Um, so it could be a blessing in disguise. But looking at that, at those numbers and looking at the whole is it's not good, is it? No, I mean, and part of the, the revenue that was expected as well, even when Bartomeu said COVID was going to be a problem, Barcelona were hoping to have fans back in the camp. No, not necessarily the museum, but back in the camp. No, by February. And now mm -hmm. if you can't even have the election until March, obviously fans are not going to be back in the stadium to help with revenue. And so fans and losing, we even do talk about the, the museum as well. And then uh, the S by Barca project, there's so much money in revenue that was expected that didn't come because of ticket sales and because of the, the sheer size of Barcelona stadium. So to lose all of that, that's where you're talking about. And the future of the club is going to still be very reliant on how this pandemic is, is dealt with moving forward in Spain and in Catalonia, because if fans can come back into the stadium by March or April, that's going to have a much, much different outcome for the next five years of Barca than if they have to wait until next August. Right. I mean, that just the amount of revenue that you're speaking about is millions and millions and millions and millions of euros. It's just, it's not the same. So I think that's a place that we leave that with the money. We, we were positive too much in this show, Frances. So we ended, I think, on the most morbid way we possibly can. But hey, let's actually end it on a positive. I'm going to go right back up as we, before we leave today, I do want to mention, um, I guess you're, it's a silly transition, but talking about our finances, I do want to give a special shout out to our Patreons. Uh, we've never done this before, but if you want us to keep making these shows and more shows, that's the way to help us out along with rating and sharing as we asked you uh, the last two weeks to do with Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you are, rating, reviewing, sharing, that, that helps a lot. So we won't do it every week, but I want to actually thank by name our patrons. First names only, of course. So please let me know if my pronunciation is wrong. I don't want to give anybody away because there's a lot of people with these names, but to Michael, John, Jeremy, Magdi, Fernando, Douglas, Francis, Chad, Mitko, Ignacio, Sam, Scott, Jeffrey, Slide, Alan, Jen, Joshua, Tuke, Daniel, Catherine, Matt, Lee, Philippe, HF, JA, WC, all those initials right in a row, Armando, <laughs> Ed, Steve, Henry, and Ivan. Thank you so much to all of those uh, people. They are guaranteed to get their questions answered every month as well. That's where, yes, I put uh, the, the match reviews up on YouTube, but the audio versions are also up usually quicker out on Patreon. And then we also have this podcast without ads on Patreon as well. So th that's what we're giving to, to patrons. But more importantly, more than anything, our patrons know that... Uh, the, the, whatever they give, the, the smallest amount that they give is what helps continue to make these shows. So it, it's not necessarily about the bonuses or the benefits and all that, but more so that it is just helping us to make these shows. So we really, really appreciate 
all that uh, some of those for years have done for us. So uh, yeah, it's the satisfaction of knowing that they will, uh, that this will fall apart without them. So we, we thank them so much for that as well. So I, I want to say uh, thank you to them, but also a thank you to all of our listeners. We did also get a rating on Apple Podcasts. I did see it. They were very complimentary of, of us, Frances. We had different compliments because we're different people, but I want to thank them. And uh, I hope that more people join them in, in shouting out the show. Uh, maybe I'll read that next week if, if people, uh, if other people give and I get a few reviews, I'll actually read some of the reviews here on the podcast. So that's another promise, an easy promise I can have. If I get enough of those, I'll read a few of them. Uh, the good ones, obviously, if you give us a bad one, then uh, I'm going to throw that in the trash. <laughs> All right. Frank, we, need, we need to read only the bad ones just for, you know, consistency. Yeah, I, I, I read them. Up, my, my wife only lets me read them at least two or three hours before bed. Because if I think if I read them, I'm going to sleep, that gives me some nightmares. But Frances, I think it's a good place to stop. Uh, so I want to thank you for joining me again, Frances, and for the listeners for tuning in. You can tap in your app, check out the show notes to subscribe to us. You can find us on social media, on Twitter, at the Mars on the Pod, or at Hilton 13 for me. On Instagram, at the Mars on the Pod. Closed Facebook group is tvpod.link. Group. That's a free group to get in. Just answer the questions. And I already mentioned the Patreon at tvpod.link. Backslash Patreon, YouTube, the Barcelona podcast. There's specialty stuff over there. And if you're watching on YouTube, thanks for joining us there. But check us out, hit that subscription button. And as I always say, thanks so much for listening to the Barcelona podcast. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. And Forza Barca. Thank you so much to all our Patreons and all our listeners. Forza.